thank you for your kind introduction. First of all, I want to emphasize how much I would love to be in Merida right now. Let's hope that this health crisis is over soon. Essentially, what I want to present today are some recent exciting developments that have opened new horizons in the modeling of environmental assisted damage. And that effectively have allowed us to use computer simulations to predict the lifetime of infrastructure exposed to aggressive environments. Because unfortunately, environmental assisted failures are far too frequent. In fact, one could argue that we have a good understanding of how structures and components behave on their own in an inert environment. But as soon as material environment interactions take place, the problem becomes highly interdisciplinary and increases significantly in complexity. Phenomena such as corrosion fatigue, hydrogen embrittlement, or localized corrosion damage are notoriously challenging for both engineers and scientists. And at this point, I must say that at RELEM's Technical Committee 293, chaired by Javier Sanchez and Alvaro de Rejo, we investigate the impact of this phenomena on the lifespan of metallic and metallic rainforest structures. And in a way, it's not surprising that we fail to predict environmental assisted failures because they're very complex phenomena crossing the boundaries of mechanics, chemistry, material science. Lots of things happen in the damage region of a material exposed to a harmful environment. Of course, the specific mechanisms at play depend on the material and the environment being considered, but factors that can govern material behavior include the transport of species, passivation and rupture of the passivation film, metal dissolution, mechanical straining, hydrogen ingress and diffusion within the crystal lattice, metal embrittlement, and so on. So the physical picture is complicated, and thus the development of predictive models is challenging. However, I will try to convince you today that there are reasons for being optimistic and that we have reached a point where we can use computer simulations to predict phenomena such as corrosion fatigue, hydrogen embrittlement, or pitting corrosion, leveraging on what we have learned in decades of experimental research. Essentially, there are two recent developments that make this possible, in my opinion. The first one is multiphysics modeling. We know well the equations that describe those physical mechanisms that I was listing before, and we finally have enough computer power to solve them in a coupled fashion. We can predict the stress state in the material, the distribution of current, potential, and various ionic species in the electrolyte, the uptake and diffusion of hydrogen, and so on. So if we know the mechanisms taking place and understand their interactions, we finally have enough computer muscle to resolve them explicitly without the need for simplifications and strong assumptions from first principles, so to say. But there's a second arguably bigger challenge from the modeling perspective. Environmentally assisted cracking phenomena are essentially interfacial problems. You can see in the slide an example of the different stages involved in the corrosion fatigue of wind turbine support structures. First, we have pits that nucleate at the seawater metal interface. Then those pits grow. And eventually we see a pit to crack transition and the propagation of fatigue cracks. So the morphology of the interface is consistently evolving and capturing this is key, not only because the chemistry is very different in an occluded environment, such as inside of a pit or a crack, but also because stages like the pit to crack transition are very sensitive to the interface shape, to the pit shape. And of course, because final failure will be driven by the evolution of that crack solid interface. And the problem here is that tracking evolving interfaces is a well-known mathematical and computational challenge. The good news is that a paradigm has been proposed that makes the tracking of interfaces an easy task. This is the so-called phase field method, which kind of goes back all the way to Van der Waals, but only recently has really taken off with the help of computers. Mathematically, we have two ways of dealing with interfaces. One is by treating the interface as a surface without a thickness, for example, a two-dimensional manifold embedded into the 3D space. Or alternatively, we can treat the interface as an object with a finite thickness by using an auxiliary facial variable that tells us where the interface lies. So in this example, we have two faces, and the facial variable takes two distinct values in each of the faces, zero or one, and then varies smoothly in between at the interface. And as you can imagine, there are multiple benefits associated with this idea of having a diffuse interface. One of them is that the interface equation is defined in the entire domain. So there's no need for a special treatment of the interface. Another benefit is that topological changes such as divisions or merging of interfaces can easily be simulated and without ad hoc criteria. 
And a third benefit is that the interface equation can be easily combined with equations describing various physical phenomena. So it is very well suited for multiphysics flows. Phase field methods are becoming notably popular in many areas in science and engineering. Two of these areas are microstructural evolution and fracture mechanics. As you can see in the slide, very complex interfacial phenomena can be simulated, such as branching and merging of cracks, the nucleation of cracks from secondary sites, and so on. I will show later also how this method can be used to track the evolution of the corrosion front, the pitting, the pitting phenomena that I was talking about before. So the possibility of being able to simulate the evolution of interfaces combined with the possibility of conducting coupled multiphysics modeling lies the basis for using computers to predict environmental assisted failures. And to extend the success of virtual testing that we have seen in the automotive or aerospace industries to civil engineering infrastructure. But before I start, I start showing some examples of applications, let me clarify the terminology that I will be using. I'll be mostly focusing on two environmentally assisted cracking phenomena, hydrogen embrittlement and pitting and cracking due to anodic dissolution. I will, look in, I will look into individual progress in these two areas, but I will also briefly discuss how to model both in a coupled manner. And hydrogen embrittlement appears twice here because it can be categorized as a stress corrosion cracking when hydrogen enters the material as a result of corrosion processes, or it can also happen in the absence of an aqueous electrolyte, as for example, when components are exposed to hydrogen gas. So let me start with the modeling of hydrogen embrittlement, which is becoming notoriously important. The issue is that hydrogen is a virus for metals. Metallic materials exposed to hydrogen experience a very significant reduction in ductility and fracture toughness. If we increase the, the content of hydrogen coming into our metallic samples, we observe a very noticeable drop in the failure strain. And the same goes for the toughness. In fact, the reduction on fracture toughness can be of up to 90% for some alloys. So hydrogen makes our otherwise ductile metals very brittle. And this of course has tremendous implications as hydrogen is the third most abundant element on the Earth's surface. Thus hydrogen embrittlement has been, all, has been a well-known concern in offshore engineering where metals are exposed to particularly aggressive environments. And the problem has gotten significantly worse through the years for mainly two reasons. The higher susceptibility of modern high strength alloys, which we use in our buildings, bridges, railways, and is leading to numerous hydrogen assisted failures. And of course, due to the promise that hydrogen holds as energy carrier of the future. We already have hydrogen fuel cars, buses, and trains in the market. And you can imagine how problematic it's going to be to store and transport hydrogen for all these applications. So there's a strong need for models, reliable models that can capture the underlying physics and that can predict hydrogen assisted fractures at scales relevant to engineering practice. And these models are going to be multiphysics and multidisciplinary, as this is a chemomechanical problem. There are many things that we don't fully understand, but we do know that hydrogen coming from water vapor, gas, or an electrochemical solution enters the metal, diffuses through the crystal lattice, and accumulates in areas of high hydrostatic stress or high volumetric strains, where the lattice expands and there's more space for the hydrogen to accumulate. Then in the fracture process zone, hydrogen interacts with the material at multiple scales and in various ways, changing the dislocation mobility, reducing the atomic bonding strength, and so on. So capturing everything is a daunting task, but we know that at the very least, a predictive model has to capture the diffusion of hydrogen and the interplay between mechanics and chemistry. So that is the first ing ingredient of a hydrogen assisted fracture model, a coupled stress diffusion problem. We need to solve an equation for the strain and the stress state, the standard balance of linear momentum. And we need to solve an equation for the transport of hydrogen within the crystal lattice. And as you can see here, the hydrogen diffusion is essentially an extended version of Fick's law. And you can immediately see the coupling with the mechanical problem that I was mentioning before through the hydrostatic stress. And let me say a few things about the mechanics and the chemistry of the problem. First, what I was showing was the simplest formulation for hydrogen diffusion. In reality, hydrogen not only diffuses freely through the lattice, but it's also trapped on microstructural sites such as grain boundaries, dislocations, carbides, and so on. So we have also developed more comprehensive models that can capture the role of multiple hydrogen trap types. And those introduce some additional couplings, as you can see here. 
Second, we need to choose a constitutive model to characterize the mechanical response of the solid. This choice depends on the scale at which we choose to characterize the problem. We know from experiments that the critical distance for hydrogen cracking is of a few microns ahead of the crack. So once we reliably characterize the critical variables, in this case, stress and hydrogen concentration at this critical distance, which is lying at the micro scale. So we need to use continuum models to deliver engineering relevant predictions. But if we want to resolve the physics of the problem, we need to model these locations individually. So what can we do? Well, you can enrich continuum models with the physical effects that you're missing at the critical distance of your problem, which is basically introducing the physics implicitly by changing your constitutive equations. And at a few microns ahead of the crack, the main effect that conventional continuum plasticity models are missing is the dislocation hardening mechanisms associated with geometrically necessary dislocations. So we have developed a new multi-scale plasticity models, so-called string gradient plasticity models, that can capture those dislocation hardening effects and the stress elevation associated with them. You can see here, plotted the tensile stress ahead of the crack tip as a function of the distance to the crack tip for both a conventional plasticity model like von Mises and a strain gradient plasticity model. Far away from the crack tip, both predictions agree, but as we approach the crack tip, as we reach a distance of a few microns ahead of the crack, the, which is basically the critical distance of hydrogen assisted cracking, then GNDs and plastic strain gradients they start playing a role and significant differences are observed. Remember how important it is to get your stresses right at the critical distance, not only because cleavage fracture will take place when a critical stress is reached, but also because the hydrogen concentration is dependent on the hydrostatic stress, as I mentioned before. In fact, when you, what you get when you use these strain gradient plasticity models to plot, for example, hydrogen concentration ahead of the crack tip is that you see a much higher hydrogen content than when using conventional models. Of course, this is a result of the elevation of the hydrostatic stress that I mentioned before. And we have compared our predictions with experimental measurements of hydrogen content ahead of the crack. And while there is some scatter, of course, because it's difficult to measure hydrogen at the micro scale, we can see a good agreement. And we can also see that only by accounting for these GNDs or strain gradient effects, we can capture two trends that we see in the experiments. The hydrogen content increases as we approach the crack tip, and then the hydrogen content increases as we increase the remote load. So we're we are relatively confident that we are going in the good direction and that we are properly characterizing the chemomechanical problem. Now let's turn our attention to the interface. When does a hydrogen crack start and when does it grow? For this, we will use the phase field method, of course. And I explained before the computational benefits of using this auxiliary phase field to track an interface. But the question now becomes, what is the differential equation governing the evolution of the phase field? In the case of the crack solid interface, one of the beauties of this method is that it provides a platform for the energy balance of Griffith, which gave birth to the discipline of fracture mechanics. Let me elaborate a bit on this. So first Griffith postulated that a crack will grow if the energy stored in the solid is sufficient to overcome the energy required to create tuning surfaces. A competition between the string energy density and the material toughness, GC, or critical energy release rate. And Griffith's energy balance can be postulated in a variational form, such that crack propagation can be predicted naturally as a result of the competition between the elastic and fracture energies, without ad hoc criteria. So minimizing this functional is all we need, but the problem lies in that we cannot track this interface gamma, the crack surface. And here's where the phase field paradigm comes to our rescue, because we can use the phase field as a marker transforming the surface integral into a volume integral and enabling us to solve this global minimality problem. And two things that you will notice here is that the phase field degrades the stiffness of the solid. So it acts as a damage variable going from zero in intact material points to one in fully cracked material points. And secondly, the so-called crack density function involves a gradient and consequently a length scale. So the model is non-local which ensures mesh independent results as long as the mesh is fine enough to resolve the landscape. So at the end of the day, we have a model that is physically sound based on Griffith and the thermodynamics of fracture, and at the same time, computationally very compelling. And we have had quite a lot of fun in the past two, three years working with facial fracture methods. Among others, we have proposed new pioneering formulations for fracturing composites, 
shape memory alloys, functionally graded materials. But the point that I want to make is that we can predict complex fracture phenomena without convergence problems on the original finite element mesh and in a physically rigorous manner. So that is the third ingredient to our model, solving the fracture problem. And the way to couple this with the hydrogen is a straightforward. What we see in the experiments is that hydrogen degrades the material toughness. So we can make the toughness GC dependent on the hydrogen concentration through a degradation function. And the key question becomes, how does that degradation function look like? Well, the beauty of this approach is that it's universal so that I can accommodate any mechanistic interpretation. One can decide to define this degradation function to be dependent on the lattice hydrogen concentration, dependent on the total hydrogen concentration, or on the hydrogen trapping grain boundaries, or on the dislocation density, or in any other macroscopic or mechanical parameter that you might think is involved in the fracture process. And of course, you can also come up with empirical degradation laws by fitting experiments. Let me elaborate on our mechanistic choice. When coming up with a degradation function, the key question that I wanted to answer was, how does hydrogen make metals brittle? How can it be that a metal that fails in a ductile manner through microvoid cracking exhibits very brittle behavior in the presence of hydrogen with, for example, grain boundary decohesion, as you can see here for nickel. So they, the, the goal here is to be able to capture this ductile to brittle shift that we observe in the experiments in the presence of hydrogen without ad hoc criteria, just by explicitly resolving the mechanisms as a natural byproduct of the simulation. Our rationale is based on three main ingredients. The first one is that atomistic calculation showed that the bonding strength between metal atoms is reduced with hydrogen occupancy. You can see here a plot of surface energy or fracture energy versus hydrogen coverage in two types of grain boundaries in nickel as obtained with DFT. You can see that if your grain boundary is full, coverage close to one, then the bonding strength is reduced by 40%. So that's the first key ingredient to develop a mechanistic understanding. If we have enough hydrogen, the cleavage strength or the grain boundary strength will be weaker. So the key question now becomes, how much hydrogen do we have in our grain boundaries? Where are we in the x-axis? Because if the occupancy is low, then this might be a secondary mechanism. The answer comes from the chemistry and the thermodynamics of hydrogen trapping. Using Noriani's equilibrium, we can plot the trap occupancy as a function of the binding energy of the trap site and the hydrogen concentration in the lattice. And you can see that a strong hydrogen traps that have a binding energy on the order of minus 40 kilojoules per mole are essentially full of hydrogen for hydrogen concentrations as low as 3, 0.3 ppm in the lattice. So it is very energetically favorable for the hydrogen to reside in grain boundaries. And this has been recently confirmed experimentally with electron probe tomography. This is from a recent science paper, and you can see how this grain boundary, the red region, is full of hydrogen atoms. So our grain boundaries are definitely going to be weaker. And when you take into account this reduction in strength in fracture energy, then you naturally see those weakened interface failing if you introduce enough hydrogen. And the theoretical lattice strength or the grain boundary strength is on the order of 10 times the yield stress. But if you consider the 30 to 40% reduction resulting for the hydrogen, and you also consider the strain gradient description of corrective stresses, the one I mentioned before, then the numbers match and you have a convincing story that requires no fitting parameters. So to summarize, we have developed a coupled deformation diffusion fracture platform, which builds upon the facial fracture method and a mechanistic and implicitly multi-scale hydrogen degradation law. And the steps are as follows. First, we solve the, mechanic, the coupled mechanical diffusion problem. We need to know how much hydrogen we have, where and when. Then one can use the thermodynamics of trapping to determine what is the occupancy, the coverage of that critical interface that we're interested in, for example, grain boundaries. Then we can go to those atomistic calculations that, we are, that are run offline and determine how much the fracture energy is degraded. So everything is done without any fitting parameter whatsoever. The phase field hydrogen degradation law is essentially a DFT relation between the fracture energy and the hydrogen coverage. For example, in the case that I'm showing here, corresponding to nickel, the degradation law is linear and this parameter in blue here equals 0 0.41. And there's one last ingredient that I want to mention, the boundary conditions and the crack phases. 
And there's two elements of this. The first one is that we have been working in resolving the electrochemical diffusion interface because we want to quantify properly how much hydrogen is coming into the sample. And the second one is that we have developed suitable boundary conditions to capture how the environment follows the crack as it propagates. If you have a crack propagating in a wind turbine monopile, you would expect the seawater to immediately occupy the space created by the new crack surface. So this can be achieved very easily using a penalty approach, as you can see in the slide. So here is the phase field crack, and this is the concentration from the environment that you can see follows nicely the, the crack growth. So let me show you some representative results obtained with this multiphysics and phase field based model for hydrogen embrittlement. First, these are R curves, so crack growth assistant curves. The applied K, so a representative of the crack tip loading, is shown on the y axis, and the crack extension is shown on the x axis. And what I'm showing here is the sensitivity of the crack growth resistant curves to the hydrogen content. You can see that in agreement with expectations, the higher the hydrogen content, the smaller the fracture resistance. And what you see in the slide are results obtained for different loading rates, showing how the model captures another well established experimental observation. The faster the loading rate, the less time the hydrogen has to reach the fracture process zone, and thus the higher the crack growth resistance. Let me move on to show some a few representative quantitative comparison with experiments. For example, what you see in the slide is a comparison with tensile tests on pre-charge, not to steel bars, so in a very promising agreement in terms of failure stress versus pre-charge hydrogen content. Here you see a set of interesting experiments where notched duplex stainless steel samples were held at a constant load in a seawater bath. So each sample is subjected to a different constant load and all of them fail at a relatively early time. You can see here, these are the experiments of symbols. What we can do with our model is not only to reproduce the experiments, but we can also run simulations over very large time scales to see what is the critical stress below which engineers can load their structure safely. And we can simulate any experiment. This is a particularly interesting case. The failure of, because the failure of bolts and screws is a well-known problem in hydrogen embrittlement. So this test involves the exposure of a metallic screw inside of concrete block to an aggressive solution. And you can see that we can capture the complete failure process up to the complete rupture of the screw. And we have gone one step forward towards practical case studies aiming to enable that virtual testing vision that I was mentioning before. These are a couple of toy examples. The first one deals with the crack propagating from existing, existing pits due to corrosion. And the second one simulates crack propagation in lifting equipment made of a high strength steel. But more excitingly, we can model large scale 3D problems and correlate our models with inspections, creating a digital twin of critical infrastructure. Here you can see a pipeline containing multiple defects due to pitting corrosion that has been characterized by La Rosa and co-workers using non-destructive evaluation. It is a 12 kilometer pipeline and we model a critical section of three meters that contains more than hundred defects. We're not limited to model cracks, but we can model defects of arbitrary geometry. In fact, in these facial models, because one solves for the damage variable is a degree of freedom, it is very easy to introduce those defects. You just need to assign an initial condition to the nodes located in damaged areas. And then you can load at the in-service condition to predict when fracture will happen. And this is shown here in this video. You can see how defects start growing here at the top, how they eventually merge. And finally, how this leads to the structural failure of the pipeline. And this looks a little bit like a video game, but I should emphasize that this is a sophisticated multi-physics model. Everything is computed on the original finite element mesh in an implicit backward Euler framework without any convergence problem and fully parallelized. We can run this in a few hours. So we have a tool that allows us to know how the crack will propagate and when it will propagate, such that we can decide when to replace the component or what are the limit service conditions. Finally, we have extended the framework to fatigue. We just need to add a fatigue degradation function and then we can deliver predictions based on the material toughness and nominal material properties. For example, you can see here how we can produce virtual SN curves with and without hydrogen, reaching a very good agreement with experiments.
And we can also predict the influence of hydrogen on Paris low coefficients or deliver virtual SN curves for any geometry. I emphasize that the Paris law behavior and the SN curve are an output of the calculation, a prediction, not an input. Fatigue failures can be predicted for arbitrary loading histories and geometries. No bells, no whistles, just an energy-based approach based on the thermodynamics of fracture, multiphysics modeling, and a mechanistic hydrogen degradation law. Now, let me move on to the second application, corrosion damage. We all know that corrosion damage is a very big problem for society, and its prediction is a massive challenge for both engineers and scientists. As I discussed before, one of the biggest challenges from the computational side is capturing how the aqueous electrolyte solid metal interface evolves. So as you can see in the video, which is by the way, a synchrotron analysis of corrosion in stainless steel, multiple pits form, interact, and under certain conditions transform into cracks. But this bottleneck can be tackled if we exploit the phase hill up concept and explicitly track the, the evolution of the electrolyte metal interface. The differential equation for the evolution of the phase field is based more on the phase field model for solidification rather than the fracture models that we have been discussing so far. Specifically, we use the KKS model, which where each material point is assumed to be a mixture of two phases with different concentrations. And the interface evolves based on the thermodynamics and local corrosion kinetics. You can find all the details of the paper. Two key contributions from our work that I want to emphasize is that we have incorporated the influence of mechanics in corrosion kinetics following the work of Goodman, and that we have incorporated for the first time the process of film rupture and repassivation, which is present in the majority of material environment systems. But I won't get into too many details for the sake of time. What I will show are some representative examples so that you can get a taste for the potential of these methods. Here you can see how the method can capture pitting corrosion and the pit to crack transition in both 2D and 3D. And of course, we have validated our model predictions with experiments, showing a very good agreement, as you can see here. I think that this method is very powerful. And in fact, I anticipate that we will see a revolution similar to what we have seen when we use phase field uh, in, the, in the fields of phase field modeling of microstructural evolution and fracture mechanics. And last but not least, we have recently developed a generalized formulation for stress corrosion cracking. So depending on the environment, you could have fractures driven by anodic mechanisms and metal dissolution, or by the uptake of hydrogen, hydrogen embrittlement, basically. So we have developed a multi-phase facial formulation that combines both facial corrosion and facial for hydrogen assisted fracture to capture the interplay between these mechanisms and the transition from one to another with a changing environment, as we see in the experiments. But I don't have to, time to get into these details, so just you can see here representative result. I will just conclude with a few remarks. The first one is that there's an opportunity now to bring computer simulations to the prediction of environmental system cracking phenomena, such as stress corrosion cracking, hydrogen embrittlement, or corrosion fatigue. And this is mainly because of two recent developments. The possibility of modeling coupled physical phenomena and the search in phase field methods to track evolving interfaces, such as corrosion pits or cracks. We have shown for the cases of hydrogen embrittlement and localized corrosion, that these powerful computational tools can resolve the underlying physics and provide a mechanistic modeling framework. And finally, what I find very exciting is that these models deliver very good agreement with experiments and can be used to model practical cases to effectively conduct virtual testing in civil engineering infrastructure that is exposed to harmful environments. And that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you also to my sponsors. And of course, many thanks to the organizers and Rilin for the opportunity to give this plenary talk and for the Gustavo Colonetti Medal. Two last comments. All my codes are openly shared with examples and documentation. So please feel free to use them and email me if you have any questions. And also currently I have a vacancy for a postdoc in facial corrosion, which is closing soon, just in case someone is interested. Thank you. <laughs>